claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we've made him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen. Thank you, Chris. So this morning we want to talk about this great misconception that so many people in the world today have, and I think even some Christians, that they have this misconception about this very topic, um, that people can have communion with God and still live in sin. What, a, what an amazing misconception. I mean, that we can have a relationship with God and still just live in any way we please. And Chris wrote, um, read this morning 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. If you want, you can turn in your Bibles there. We will be referring to it every now and then. So, Lord, I think life form, if you think about every kind of life form that exists in the world today, has an enemy. I mean, bugs watch out for hungry birds, right? You ever seen the cicadas on the tree and the, 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 they, 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 they make that noise and the little sparrow comes, where's that noise coming from? And he grabs that cicada and off he goes. And as he's going, you hear the as he's flying off. Well, and, and then the bird goes and lands on the ground, and he's got an enemy because there's a cat hiding behind a bush that wants to catch him. And, and so the story goes, and there's always an enemy that we have to deal with. Even human beings have to dodge automobiles when you cross the road. I mean, have you ever tried to cross some of the highways and stuff? I mean, some people actually lose their lives in doing that. We fight germs, we fight viruses, we fight disease. We have enemies that we face in the world today. And everybody has a very real influential enemy that we read about in these particular verses, okay? And that is that people have always had the misconception regarding the truth of God's Word in their relationship with God. It's almost like a person would come and say, just wait a minute, hey, we already have fellowship with God, don't we? We already worship God and we feel safe. We feel acceptable in our religion. We don't need someone else to show us how to become acceptable to God. Why would we need anyone else? We can reach God in our own terms. We can secure His approval for ourselves. I mean, just by doing our own stuff. We don't need someone to tell us how to approach God or how we should worship God or how we should secure his approval and most people have that there's this misconception or this belief that they can do just as they please and this is what this section is all about man objects to the idea that jesus is the very son of god they don't want to hear that man objects to the also objects to the idea that in the way that he worships god and that his worship might actually be wrong man also objects to the idea that he has merit with god or that he is unacceptable to God that's totally unacceptable. I mean, everyone is accepted by God. Doesn't the Bible say, for God so loved the world? I mean, that means everyone, right? Man rejects the idea that he needs help in reaching God. Man feels sufficient within himself. And this morning we're going to look at that misconception that so many have. The misconception strikes right at the belief that is held by most people on the face of the earth today. And that lie is that we can have fellowship with God and still walk in darkness. Is that we can have fellowship with God and still walk in sin. This is a great misconception. And the fundamental difficulty here or that, we, that, 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 that John writes about is that word sin. No one wants to hear that, right? No one wants to know that we are a sinner. People today love to minimize and redefine sin, often alleging that their failures in life and their certain disorders exist because how other people treated them. The victim mentality reigns supreme as popular culture comforts itself in affirming that people are basically good and that whatever might be wrong in their lives isn't really wrong at all, but merely the preference of personal freedom. So that's what people think today. And instead of accepting responsibility for their behavior, people demand to be accepted simply as they are, without any change. People try to reclassify serious heart issues, and I'm not talking about the ticker that's in your chest. I'm talking about the spiritual issues. And they try to address these issues as illnesses or addictions, and they try to cure them with 
psychotherapy or prescription drugs, when all, it, all, all that needs to be addressed is the heart issue or the sin issue that is found in man's heart. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23, he says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from, from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and these are the things that defile a person. So they're not from P from outside, but they come deep within the heart of man. You see, the Bible says that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who shall know it? And many in the church today are reluctant to make the diagnosis that Jesus made in this particular verse for fear that they might offend someone or they might be deemed as being unloving. And I think that's the problem in the church is that we really don't stand for what the truth of God's Word says. And thus sin is explained away as culturally, in, in culturally acceptable terms. There was some time ago when I um, confronted the abortion issue at a Bible class and I was told that, that that's not culturally acceptable. And I was, what are you talking about? Well, the fact is, people do shy away from certain issues that we find in God's Word. Remember that last week in the, in we, we, we said that in Scripture, darkness refers to sin, evil, and everything that shouldn't be, and everything that a person shouldn't do. We touched on that, and we, we mentioned that about walking in the light. In fact, the darkness stood for a Christless life. And so many people, even within the church today, are living lives that are in darkness. Darkness also means that we are under the influence or the power of Satan. Darkness is connected with lovelessness and hate. Some Christians are still walking in darkness. Did you know this, the, uh, over the recent month or so, the last six weeks, Kanye West came out and he made a profession of faith, a declaration so bold that it's, it's shaken the rock world, as it were. Uh, those of you who don't know who Kanye West is, he's married to Kim Kardashian. I'm sure you all know who she is. Okay? And I was reading some stuff about his life and how he's spoken to his wife, and, he's, and, he's, and he said, I don't want you dressing so, pro so provocatively anymore. I, I, I want us to live a real Christian life. And, and I listened to an interview with him, and he was speaking about his faith and, and how he described his faith. He said, it was like this. If you think of, and, and he tries to explain it to people, and he says, you know when people, they, 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 you, you can sleep, and you, and you have eight hours of sleep or whatever, and you wake up the next morning, and you're no longer sleeping, but, but you're awake, and, 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 you've, and he said, well, that's what happened to me. I was sleeping, I was dead, I was asleep, and I woke up, and now I'm alive, and I can walk with God. And he made, makes no qualms about it. I love that fact. In fact, he had a testimony. He said that last year he made $150 million. And he submitted his taxes, and um, he came to find out at the end of the day he was $37 million in the hole you know, because of his expenses or whatever. Now, to you and I, that's a lot of money. But when you're in that kind of realm, it's not that great of money. Okay? And then he testified, however, he got his tax return, which was $68 million. Isn't that amazing? And he praised God for that. Now, I don't know what he's going to do with that. He's responsible for his... But I thank God that here's a man in that area. And I told my wife, and I said, Sharon, we'll never be able to reach that person probably. But he's reaching people we'd never be able to reach. And I praise God that the Word of God is going forth and touching lives, even through Kanye West and his family. You see, salvation is not the end. It's only the beginning. And I love that Greg Lowry wrote him a letter as a new believer, and he, and he encouraged him, and he, Greg said, listen, this is wonderful that you're walking on this path. And he told him, and he led him through the steps of the basic Christianity. I love that about him. You see, walking involves progress, you and I who are believers. We're supposed to advance in our spiritual life. We can't be stagnant in our lives. And just as a child must learn to walk and overcome so many difficulties in life, so you and I who are believers, you and I need to walk in the light. And as we're walking, we too need to overcome difficulties in our lives. There was once an angry church member who came to a pastor and she said, um, why do you keep preaching to us as Christians about sin? After all, the life, um, the life of a Christian is different from the sin in the life of an unsaved person. And the pastor looked at her straight in the eye and he said, yes, I agree with you. It is different. It's much worse in the Christian's life. 
And that's true. Because we say we have faith in Jesus, and yet sometimes we still flirt with the world and we still have one foot in the world. Walking in darkness means that we are in, in the dark about God and sin. We cannot see nor talk to God face to face. How then can people know that God really exists if their world, if they're in the dark about God? You see, we cannot straddle the fence. It's almost, and I use a simple illustration, if you're walking with a flashlight, you're either walking in the light, but you can't shine, you can't walk in both. You can't walk in darkness and at the light in the same time. It's impossible. You cannot do it. And sometimes we choose as believers, even though we have the light of Christ, we turn our back on His, on his light and we walk in darkness. You see, the world is in the dark about God. When we rub shoulders, when you're on the train, wherever you might be, maybe in your very own family, there are those who are in darkness. When it comes to God, most of humanity, in fact, is in darkness because they cannot see God nor talk to God. People can't even be sure that God exists. They have a notion that He might exist. Why? Because man's physical senses of flesh and blood can only know the things of the physical and material world. If there is a God, if there is a spiritual world, people have absolutely no way to penetrate it because they have no concept of the spiritual life. People can study technology and science and use all their intellectual and creative reasoning, but they will never be able to penetrate the spiritual world. Because they just don't understand spiritual things. They are, they are in darkness. Man and his world are completely in the dark about God. No matter what the person may claim, or no matter what they say, they may be spiritual, or they may be religious, but they're still in the dark. And some of us, we've heard people say, well, I'm a spiritual person. Well, what does that mean? Do you believe in Jesus, that He's the Messiah? Is He your Lord and Savior? Have you surrendered your life to Him? How are you born again? No. Well, then you're in the dark, no matter how spiritual you may call yourself. Or how religious. Secondly, then how can, you, how can man know God and fellowship with God? Well, there's only one way. God had to leave the spiritual realm, and He took, then came into this dimension of this world. He had to enter into the physical world and dimension. That's your, where we exist in this world. God has come to earth, and He revealed Himself to us. This is the only conceivable way that man could ever fellowship with God, and it's, this is the glorious gospel that we preach. This was John's testimony that we spoke about last week, that Jesus, the very Son of God, had come to earth and that man can have fellowship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. There is no way to have fellowship with God other than through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is no way. Then he addresses the foolishness of man. People reject the Son of God and declare, well, we can have fellowship with God and still walk in darkness. I've heard people say that. I can still flirt. I can still do this. I, no, you can't. That's not what Scripture teaches. And church, you and I need to stand up for the truth of God's Word. People claim that they can find God on their own terms. They claim that they can be good enough to fellowship with God and secure God's approval for themselves. People believe that they can use their own mind and their own reasoning to discover enough about God to become acceptable with Him and to fellowship with Him. Where do they get that? Certainly not from Scripture. Most people believe that they can do enough in their own terms, in their own goodness, in their own estimation of themselves to try and please God and receive His approval. Well, I'm not as bad as Joe down the road who's, who's stolen and committed adultery. I've never done that. Yeah, but you're still missing your relationship with God. You're still in darkness. They believe that God would never reject them but will always accept them. Most people believe that if they believe in God and do the things halfway right, then their belief is good enough and their deeds are good enough to, to put God in their debt. God owes me because I'm trying. God owes mankind nothing. Absolutely nothing. In fact, we are in God's debt. He's given it all to us that you and I can know Him as Lord and Savior. Therefore, they conclude that they can reject Jesus as the Son of God and still have fellowship with God and be acceptable to Him by believing that God exists by doing enough good and that they can please God by doing good. Works-oriented. We can do as much good as we want, and you will never attain God's favor. Never. No matter how many kudos you got behind your name, 
But what does Scripture say to anyone who says this? Look what the Bible says in our reading. We lie and we do not live out the truth. That's what the Scripture says. We lie and we do not live out the truth. Are you telling me I'm a liar? I'm not telling you that. John is telling you that through the inspiration of God Himself. If we say we can live like that, we are liars. Are you calling me a liar? No, I'm not. God is. And if we live that way, we're liars. No matter how great in our minds and our thoughts we imagine God to be, and no matter how many good works we do, we are not doing the truth. That's the Bible. That's Scripture. That's what Jesus teaches us. And the only way possible that we could ever hope to know God and to know Him accurately was for God Himself to come to earth. To profess that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness is an absolute lie from the very pit of hell itself. And people believe this own lie. And the more they propagate this lie, the more they believe it and the more they become convinced of such a lie. It takes God, the Holy Spirit, to move in our lives, to wake us up to, for, to the reality that we cannot live this way. Let me briefly segue and talk about the most important factor in our experience of life that's very real, and that is the point of honesty. We need to get to the point of being honest with ourselves. We must be honest with ourselves, honest with others, and honest before God. Some of us are living double lives. We are liars. In verses 6 and verse 8, describe a believer who is, who is living a dishonest life. He's a phony. He's playing a, a, a role, acting a part, but not living a genuine, but he is living an insincere life. And maybe some of us this morning, we fool people around because we can talk the talk, but we're not living the life that we proclaim, that we, are, that, that, that we say we believe. If we say we have fellowship with Him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth, John says in verse 6. Wow! And then he says in verse 8, And if we say we have no sin, we declare ourselves, um, we, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Oh, we can work it out. God's loving. He'll, he'll understand. Yeah, He understands sin. And sin separates us from God. And the only way that we can come to God is through Jesus Christ, who paid the price for us. Therefore, whatever a person does or, as, or to approach God, all that he tries to use, all man-made methods are useless and come to naught. Taking any approach to God other than by the Son of God Himself, we take a false approach. The Word of God is pretty clear and strong when it says, if a person says that they are saved and live in darkness of this world, they are actually lying. Wow. It's a wake-up call to the church, to believers who say they walk in the light and yet they, they compromise their walk. God is light, and therefore if a person walks in darkness, he doesn't know God, nor is he in fellowship with God. They're merely lying to themselves and they're believing a falsity. A dishonest person will always lose something. They will lose their relationship with the Lord. They will lose God's blessings in their life. And they will lose fellowship with God's people. How do I know that? Because the moment a person starts drifting from God, they, they abscond from being in fellowship. The moment we find ourselves in difficulty and struggling with our faith, we abscond. We don't want to have anything to do with the Bible because there seems to be the, the, the believers hold one another accountable. And we should, church. A dishonest person will always lose something. And what have you lost? What have we lost? As a result, prayer becomes an empty form to them. Worship is a dull routine and they become critical of other, other believers and they start staying away from church. The most critical people within Christendom we find oftentimes in the church is because they're not walking close to Jesus. The closer you draw to Jesus, the less critical we become of one another because our focus is on Jesus and Him alone. Look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? None. The answer is none. We cannot fellowship with darkness. There is nothing that we can do with darkness. A person who is a liar only robs himself of reality, but keeps himself not only from, from reality, but he keeps himself or herself from growing in the Lord. His true self is smothered by the false self. 
Don't lie to yourself. Be a person of integrity and truthfulness as we stand before God. Re declare who you are boldly in the sight of God. You see, the writer of Proverbs has said it very succinctly. And he says that the way of the wicked is like a deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. And so oftentimes Christians say, well, why is this happening to me? Why, is my, why are my wheels falling off? Why am I struggling in my faith so much? Maybe it's because we're still living in darkness. We haven't fully come into the light. Oh, we've seen the light, maybe in the distance. And we want the light. And it's so beautiful, the light. But we're hanging on to the darkness. And God wants to set us free. He wants to set you and I free that we can walk in the light. We cannot have fellowship with God and walk in darkness. The truth is that we must walk in the light. What is the light of God? It is the revelation of God himself to us. This is the light of God, that Jesus Christ came in the form of man. He came to earth to reveal God. The light of God is the revelation of just how, what, how God wants us to live, how he wants us to conduct our lives. The question is, are we conducting our lives the way he wants us to conduct our lives? Jesus showed us exactly how to live, to walk in his light, to be fully, be fully believing what the Son of God came to do. There's two wonderful things that we can understand here. You see, if we walk in the light of Christ, then we have fellowship with Christ and, the God, and God and with God and with all believers as we walk in the light. And I spoke about that last week. We're not going to expound on that. The result is glorious. It means that we have true fellowship. And we actually know God. And we have communion with Him. We fellowship with Him. we one with Him. That's what we celebrated this morning as we broke bread together, symbolizing our unity and our oneness with Him. But He says in verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one with another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. It's only the blood of Jesus that can purify us from sin. So the only way that we have to understand what John is saying is if we, we want to have fellowship with God, we have to apply the blood of Christ to our lives. So when the righteousness and the holy the God looks at us, He sees the blood of Jesus upon our lives. And that's the only way we can be acceptable to God is through Christ himself. It is impossible to walk both in the light and the darkness at the same time. It's an impossibility. If we walk in the light of Christ, then the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. It's only as we walk in the light of Christ. If you're walking in darkness, Christ's blood has no effect upon your life. Sin by its very nature brings death. And the effect is certain, as, 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 as is the law of gravity. Mankind is guilty of offending God and transgressing His law. Every single human being is guilty. And with any law, when it is broken, there, has to be a, there is a penalty. And the penalty has to be paid. It has to be paid. The lawbreaker has to pay, or someone else has to step forward and pay the penalty for him. This is precisely what Jesus did. He not only came to reveal God to us, He came and He took our sins upon Himself, His transgressions upon Himself, as well as the guilt that we suffer with Him. Christ Jesus died for our sin. He, that's why He came, because we couldn't save ourselves. Jesus didn't die for His own sins. He didn't have any sins to die for. He was perfect in all His ways. Instead, by this transaction that we human beings may never fully understand, he died for the sins of all those who would believe in him. I don't understand it fully, but man, do I love it and appreciate it. This morning when we were praying for the church, we prayed that God would touch lives and that God would come and reveal himself mightily to us. And I do believe that, that when we gather in his name, God moves. You see, when Jesus came... He faced judgment for us. He suffered the punishment for us. He bore condemnation for us. And the blood of Jesus Christ was shed on the cross of Calvary for you and I. And to walk in the light of Christ means that we walk believing that Jesus died for us. That's what it means to believe. It means that we believe that the blood cleanses us from sin. It washes us. It purifies us. You see, when people commit their lives to Jesus, their identity becomes Christ. I love that about Kanye West. His identity is not in Kanye West anymore, but it's in Jesus. And he's quite bold about it. 
Now, he may lose some business because of that. doesn't matter. He will stand for Jesus. And Sharon and I prayed for him this morning. Because when you stand out of the crowd like that, you're ahead of the crowd and you're going to get the flack. You're going to get the tomatoes. You're going to get everything because you're out front. And so we pray God's covering on him, that he will stand firm in his convictions and in his belief. It means that Jesus actually paid the penalty for our sins and thereby, thereby we are freed from the guilt of sin. And when we walk in the light of Jesus, God sees our sin covered. Christians will not be made completely perfect until Jesus Christ comes again and he brings us and ushers us into his kingdom. And until then, genuine believers desire to walk in the light and so refuse conscientiously to harbor sin. That is our choice. What decision have we made? Have we said to the Lord, Lord, I will walk in the light, and if there's sin in my life, reveal it to me. I want to put it aside. I want to live the life you call me to. When believers do sin, God has already made the provision through the blood of Jesus. God accepts us only as we are in Christ. And it is this provision that allows us as believers to walk in the light, dealing with sin through confession and then receiving His forgiveness in our lives. John wrote in verse 9, If we confess our sins, listen to this, if we confess our sins, not to me, I, will, I can't forgive you. That's heresy. No person can forgive me. Not on this earth, because no one is perfect. Only Jesus can forgive us. So if we confess our sins, who is faithful? Jesus, He is faithful. And just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is no penance that you can ever do that will merit your forgiveness. It's impossible. It's counter the Scriptures. And some of you have come from different backgrounds. I understand that, where that was a big deal. You'd go see a man behind in a booth, and you'd tell him everything about you, and he'd tell you, yeah, do the X, Y, Z, and you'd go and do that, and you think you're forgiven? Well, you're not. Only Jesus can forgive you. Only Christ can forgive you. That's what confession is. We bring our confession to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's not scriptural if we do it any other way. The word purify or cleanse, it literally is in the present tense is that Jesus is continuously cleansing us from sin as we confess our sin to Him. Every time I mess up, I say, Lord, would you forgive me? And guess what? Right there and then He does. If I really mean it, if I repent of that sin, and that means turning away from that sin, instead of sinning this way, I walk away from that sin. I repent of that sin. That's what confession is all about. That's what repentance is all about. If we are walking in the light of Jesus and His blood is always cleansing us from our sin, and when we walk in fellowship with Him, we are constantly confessing our sin to Him because His Spirit dwells within us. We're open to confession before Him. You and I who are believers, we are in fellowship with Jesus, not just sometimes or certain times of the day or certain times of the week or when we gather on a Sunday morning. We are in communion with Him all the time because He walks with us and He talks with us as we travel along the day. Believers ought to acknowledge God in every way, praying and praising and confessing our shortcomings and our sin. And a believer who walks in fellowship with Jesus like this is constantly being cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. This is precisely the point that John is making. And this is precisely the point that so many people miss in the world today. People throughout the centuries and maybe even today, we cannot erase the sins of our past. We have no way to pay for the penalty and the judgment of our sins. Therefore, the penalty had to be paid. Someone had to pay the penalty. The payment had to be made or, uh, by someone who is perfect. And that's someone we know to be Jesus. He paid it. This is the terrible dilemma that man faces. For who is perfect other than God? No one is. Only the Son of God is perfect. And this was the reason that Jesus Christ came to earth. Jesus came to take the sins upon himself, becoming a substitute that we don't have to die. Jesus died for mankind, his death and his shed blood covers our sins. And no person can be acceptable to God unless they are free of sin. Wow. Does that mean to say I will not sin? No. But it means that the blood of the Lamb covers your sin when you confess it to him. So I keep a short list. The end of every day, talk to the Lord. 
Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 28, This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you. For what? For the forgiveness of sin. Christ shed his blood on the cross for the forgiveness of sin. That's what we celebrated again this morning as we broke bread. This is precisely what Paul said to the church in Rome when he said that God demonstrates his own love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, when Jesus died and he had you and I on his mind, our redemption he had on his mind. And since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? God, when you accept Jesus Christ, God's wrath is removed from you because he sees Jesus, his precious beloved son. If we are guilty of believing the misconception that we can have communion with God and still live in sin, confess that as a sin, as a, as, as a, as a very serious sin. Bring it before the Lord and Lord say, and tell him, Lord, I, I confess this. Lord, I believe this, that I, can, that I can walk in the light and yet still sin. That's sin itself. Bring it to the Lord. Confess it and receive Christ's forgiveness. Because it says in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I would never want to make Jesus a liar. I want his word to dwell in me richly, to change my life, to change our lives as a community of faith. That's how much God loves us. And so don't believe the lie that the world propagates and puts out there. Oh, you're good enough. I'm spiritual enough. Or I can work my own salvation out. No one can do that. And that's why Jesus Christ came. That's why God sent his beloved. Is because we couldn't save ourselves. We needed a perfect sacrifice in Jesus. Amen.